Ride the Tiger by Julius Evola, Chapter 1, The Modern World and Traditional Man. This book sets out to study some of the ways in which the present age appears essentially as an age of dissolution. At the same time, it addresses the question of what kind of conduct and what form of existence are appropriate under the circumstances for a particular human type. This restriction must be kept in mind. What I am about to say does not concern the ordinary man of our day. On the contrary, I have in mind the man who finds himself involved in today's world, even at its most problematic and paroxysmal points. Yet he does not belong inwardly to such a world, nor will he give into it. He feels himself, in essence, as belonging to a different race from that of the overwhelming majority of his contemporaries. The natural place for such a man the land in which he would not be a stranger, is the world of tradition. I use the word tradition in a special sense, which I have defined elsewhere. It differs from the common usage, but is close to the meaning given to it by René Gounon in his analysis of the crisis of the modern world. In this particular meaning, a civilization or society is traditional when it is ruled by principles that transcend what is merely human and individual when all its sectors are formed and ordered from above, and directed to what is above. Beyond the variety of historical forms, there has existed an essentially identical and constant world of tradition. I have sought elsewhere to define its values in main categories, which are the basis for any civilization, society, or ordering of existence that calls itself normal in a higher sense, and is endowed with real significance. Everything that has come to predominate in the modern world is the exact antithesis of any traditional type of civilization. Moreover, the circumstances make it increasingly unlikely that anyone, starting from the values of tradition, even assuming that one could still identify it and adopt them, could take actions or reactions of a certain efficacy that would provoke any real change in the current state of affairs. After the last worldwide upheavals, there seems to be no starting point, either for nations or for the vast majority of individuals, nothing in the institutions and general state of society, nor in the predominant ideas, interests, and energies of this epoch. Nevertheless, a few men exist who are, so to speak, still on their feet among the ruins and the dissolution, and who belong, more or less consciously, to that other world. A little group seems willing to fight on, even in lost positions. So long as it does not yield, does not compromise itself by giving in to the seductions that would condition any success it might have, its testimony is valid. For others, it is a matter of completely isolating themselves, which demands an inner character, as well as privileged material conditions, which grow scarcer day by day. All the same, this is the second possible solution. I would add that there are very few in the intellectual field who can still affirm traditional values beyond any immediate goal, so as to perform a holding action. This is certainly useful to prevent current reality from shutting off every horizon, not only materially, but also ideally, and stifling any measures different from its own. Thanks to them, distances may be maintained, other possible dimensions, other meanings of life, indicated to those able to detach themselves from looking only to the here and now. But this does not resolve the practical personal problem apart from the case of the man who is blessed with the opportunity for material isolation. Of those who cannot or will not burn their bridges with current life, and who must therefore decide how to conduct their existence, even on the level of the most elementary reactions in human relations. This is precisely the type of man that the present book has in mind. To him applies the saying of a great precursor, The desert enroaches. Woe to him whose desert is within. He can in truth find no further support from without. There no longer exist the organizations and institutions that, in a traditional civilization and society, would have allowed him to realize himself wholly 
to order his own existence in a clear and unambiguous way, and to defend and apply creatively in his own environment the principal values that he recognizes within himself. Thus, there is no question of suggesting to him lines of action that adequate and normative in any regular traditional civilization can no longer be so in an abnormal life, in an environment that is utterly different socially, psychically, intellectually, and materially, in a climate of general dissolution, in a system ruled by scarcely restrained disorder, and in any way lacking any legitimacy from above. Thence come the specific problems that I intend to treat here. There is an important point to clarify at the outset regarding the attitude to be taken toward survivals. Even now, especially in Western Europe, there are habits, institutions, and customs from the world of yesterday, that is, from the bourgeois world, that have a certain persistence. In fact, when crisis is mentioned today, what is meant is precisely the bourgeois world. It is the basis of bourgeois civilization and society that suffer these crises and are struck by dissolution. This is not what I call the world of tradition. Socially, politically, and culturally, what is crashing down is the system that took shape after the revolution of the Third Estate and the First Industrial Revolution. Even though there were often mixed up in it some remnants of a more ancient order, drained of their original vitality. What kind of relationship can the human type whom I intend to treat here have with such a world? The question is essential. On it depend both the meaning to be attributed to the phenomena of crisis and dissolution that are ever more apparent today, and the attitude to be assumed in the face of them, and toward whatever they have not yet undermined and destroyed. The answer to this question can only be negative. The human type I have in mind has nothing to do with the bourgeois world. He must consider everything bourgeois as being recent and anti-traditional, born from processes that in themselves are negative and subversive. In many cases, one can see in the present critical phenomena a kind of nemesis or rebound effect, although I cannot go into details here. It is the, the very forces that, in their time, were set to work against the previous traditional European civilization that have rebounded against those who have summoned them, sapping them in their turn and carrying, to a further degree, the general process of disintegration. This appears very clearly, for example, in the socio-economic field, through the obvious relationship between the bourgeois revolution of the Third Estate and the successive socialist and Marxist movements, through democracy and liberalism on the one hand, and socialism on the other. The first revolution simply prepared the way for the second, whereupon the latter, having let the bourgeoisie perform that function, aimed solely at eradicating them. In view of this, there is one solution to be eliminated right away. The solution of those who want to rely on what is left of the bourgeois world, defending and using it as a bastion against the more extreme currents of dissolution and subversion. Even if they have tried to reanimate or reinforce those remnants with some higher and more traditional values. In the first place, considering the general situation that becomes clearer every day since those crucial events that are the two world wars and their repercussions, to adopt such an orientation signifies self-deception as to the existence of material possibilities. The transformations that have already taken place go too deep to be reversible. The energies that have been liberated, or which are in the course of liberation, are not such as can be reconfirmed within the structures of yesterday's world. The very fact that attempts at reaction have referred to those structures alone, which are void of any superior legitimacy, has made the subversive forces all the more vigorous and aggressive. In the second place, such a path would lead to a compromise that would be inadmissible as an ideal and perilous as a tactic. As I have said, the traditional values in the sense that I understand them are not bourgeois values, but the very antithesis of them. 
thus to recognize any validity in those survivals, to associate them in any way with traditional values, and to validate them with the latter, with the intentions already described, would be either to demonstrate a feeble grasp of, it, of the traditional values themselves, or else to diminish them and drag them down to a deplorable and risky form of compromise. I say risky because however one attaches the traditional ideas to the residual forms of the bourgeois civilization, one exposes them to the attack, in some respects inevitable, legitimate, and necessary, currently mounted against that civilization. One is therefore obliged to turn to the opposite solution, even if things thereby become still more difficult, and one runs into another type of risk, it is good to sever every link with all that which is destined sooner or later to collapse. The problem will then be to maintain one's essential direction without leaning on any given or transmitted form, including forms that are authentically traditional but belong to past history. In this respect, continuity can only be maintained on an essential plane, so to speak, as an inner orientation of being, beside the greatest possible external liberty. As we shall soon see, the support that the tradition can continue to give does not refer to positive structures, regular and recognized by some civilization already formed by it, but rather to that doctrine that contains its principles only in their superior performal state, anterior to the particular historical formulations a state that in the past had no pertinence to the masses, but had the character of an esoteric doctrine. For the rest, given the impossibility of acting positively in the sense of a real and general return to the normal system, and given the impossibility within the climate of modern society, culture, and customs of molding one's whole existence in an organic and unitary manner, it remains to be seen on what terms one can accept situations of utter dissolution without being inwardly touched by them. What in the current phase, which is, in the last analysis, a transitional one, can be chosen, separated from the rest, and accepted as a free form of behavior that is not outwardly anachronistic? Can one thus measure oneself against what is most advanced in a contemporary thought and lifestyle, while remaining inwardly determined and governed by a completely different spirit. The advice, don't go to the place of defense, but to the place of attack, must be adopted by the group of differentiated men, late children of the tradition, who are in question here. That is to say, it might be better to contribute to the fall of that which is already wavering, and belongs to yesterday's world than to try to prop it up and prolong its existence artificially. It is a possible tactic and useful to prevent the final crisis from being the work of the opposition, whose initiative one would then have to suffer. The risks of such a course of action are more than obvious. There is no saying who will have the last word. But in the present epoch, there is nothing that is not risky. This is perhaps the one advantage that it offers to those who are still on their feet. The basic ideas to be drawn from what has been said so far can be summarized as follows. The significance of the crises and the dissolutions that so many people deplore today should be stated, indicating the real and direct object of the destructive processes, bourgeois civilization and society. But measured against traditional values, these latter were already the first negation of a world anterior and superior to them. Consequently, the crisis of the modern world could represent, in Hegel's terms, a negation of a negation, so as to signify a phenomenon that, in its own way, is positive. This double negation might end in nothingness, in the nothingness that erupts in multiple forms of chaos, dispersion, rebellion, and protest, that characterize many tendencies of recent generations, or in that other nothingness that is scarcely hidden behind the organized system of material civilization. 
Alternatively, for the men in question here, it might create a new free space that could eventually become the premise for a future formative action. Chapter 2. The End of a Cycle, Ride the Tiger The idea just mentioned refers to a perspective that does not really enter into the argument of this book because it is not concerned with inner personal behavior, but with outer circumstances, not with present-day reality, but with an unpredictable future upon which one's own conduct should in no wise depend. This is a perspective already alluded to, which sees that the present time may, in the last analysis, be a transitional epoch. I will say only a little about it before approaching our principal problem. The reference point here is given by the traditional doctrine of cycles, and by the idea that the present epoch, with all its typical phenomena, corresponds to the terminal phase of a cycle. The phrase chosen as the title of this book, Ride the Tiger, may serve as a transition between what has been said hitherto and this other order of ideas. The phrase is a Far Eastern saying, expressing the idea that if one succeeds in riding a tiger, not only does one avoid having it leap on one, but if one can keep one's seat and not fall off, one may eventually get the better of it. Those who are interested may be reminded of a similar theme found in the schools of traditional wisdom, such as the ox-herding episodes of Japanese Zen. While in classical antiquity there is a parallel in the trials of Mithras, who lets himself be dragged by the bull and will not let go until the animal stops, whereupon Mithras kills it. This symbolism is applicable at various levels. First, it can refer to a line of conduct in the interior personal life, then to the appropriate attitude in the face of critical, historical, and collective situations. In the latter case, we are interested in the relation of the symbol to the doctrine of cycles, with regard to both the general structure of history and the particular aspect of it that refers to the sequence of the four ages. This is a teaching that, as I have shown elsewhere, bears identical traits in the East and in the ancient West. In the classical world, it was presented in terms of humanity's progressive descent from the Golden Age to what Hesiod called the Iron Age. In the corresponding Hindu teachings, the final age is called the Kali Yuga, Dark Age. Its essential quality is emphatically said to be a climate of dissolution in which all the forces, individual and collective, material, psychic, and spiritual, that were previously held in check by a higher law and by influences of a superior order, pass into a state of freedom and chaos. The text of Tantra have a striking image for this situation, saying that it is the time when Kali is wide awake. Kali is a female divinity symbolizing the elementary, primordial forces of the world and of life. But in her lower aspects, she is also presented as a goddess of sex and orgiastic rites. In previous ages, she was sleeping, that is, latent in the latter aspects. But in the Dark Age, she is said to be completely awake and active. Everything points to the fact that exactly this situation has been reached in recent times having for its epicenter the civilization and society of the West, from which it has rapidly spread over the whole planet. It is not too forced an interpretation to link this with the fact that the present epoch stands on, under the zodiacal sign of Aquarius, the waters in which everything turns to a fluid and formless state, thus predictions made many centuries ago, for these ideas go back that far, appear strangely timely today. One finds here an, an analogy to what I have said above regarding the problem of what attitude is proper to the final age, associated here with riding the tiger. In fact, the texts that discuss the Kali Yuga and the age of Kali also declare 
that the norms of life, valid during epochs in which divine forces were more or less active and alive, must be considered as cancelled in the final age. During the latter, there lives an essentially different human type who is incapable of following the ancient precepts. Not only that, but because of the different historical and even planetary circumstances, such precepts, even if followed, would not yield the same results. For this reason, different norms apply, and the rule of secrecy is lifted from certain truths, a certain ethic, and the particular rights to which the rule previously applied on account of their dangerous character and because they contravened the forms of a normal existence, regulated by the sacred tradition. No one can fail to see the significance of this convergence of views. In this, as in other points, my ideas, far from having a personal and contingent character, are essentially linked to perspectives already known to the world of tradition, when abnormal situations in general were foreseen and analyzed. We shall now examine the principle of riding the tiger as applied to the external world and the total environment. Its significance can be stated as follows. When a cycle of civilization is reaching its end, it is difficult to achieve anything by resisting it and by directly opposing the forces in motion. The current is too strong. One would be overwhelmed. The essential thing is not to let oneself be impressed by the omnipotence and apparent triumph of the forces of the epoch. These forces, devoid of connection with any higher principle, are in fact on a short chain. One should not become fixated on the present and on things at hand, but keep in mind the conditions that may come about in the future. Thus, the principle to follow could be that of letting the forces and processes of this epoch take their own course, while keeping oneself firm and ready to intervene when the tiger, which cannot leap on the person riding it, is tired of running. The Christian injunction, resist not evil, may have a similar meaning if taken in a very particular way. One abandons direct action and retreats to a more internal position. The perspective offered by the doctrine of cyclical laws is implicit here. When one cycle closes, another begins, and the point at which a given process reaches its extreme is also the point at which it turns in the opposite direction. But there is still a problem of continuity between the two cycles. To use an image from Hoffmannsthal, the positive solution would be that of a meeting between those who have been able to stay awake through the long night and those who may appear the next morning. But one cannot be sure of this happening. It is impossible to foresee with certainty how and on what plane there can be any continuity between the cycle that is nearing its end and the next one. Therefore, the line of conduct to be followed in the present epoch must have an autonomous character and an imminent individual value. I mean to say that the attraction of positive prospects, more or less short-term, should not play an important part in it. They might be entirely lacking right up to the end of the cycle, and the possibilities offered by a new movement beyond the zero point might concern others coming after us who may have held equally firm without awaiting any direct results or exterior changes. Before leaving this topic and resuming my principal argument, it may be useful to mention another point connected to cyclical laws. This concerns the relationship between Western civilization and the other civilizations, especially those of the East. Among those who have recognized the crisis of the modern world and who have also abandon the idea that modern civilization is the civilization par excellence, the zenith and measure of all others, some have turned their eyes to the East. They see there, to a certain degree, a traditional and spiritual orientation to life that has long ceased to exist in the West as the basis for the effective organization of the various realms of existence. They have even wondered whether the East might furnish useful reference points for a revival and reintegration of the West. It is important to have a clear view of the domain to which such a proposition might apply. If it is simply a matter of doctrines and intellectual contacts, the attempt is legitimate. But one should take note that valid examples and points of reference 
are to be found, at least partially, in our own traditional past without having to turn to non-European civilizations. Not much is to be gained by any of this, however. It would be a matter of conversations at a high level between isolated individuals, cultivators of metaphysical systems. If one is more concerned with real influences that have a powerful effect on existence, one should have no illusions about them. The East itself is now following in our footsteps, ever more subject to the ideas and influences that have led us to the point at which we find ourselves, modernizing itself and adopting our own secular and materialistic forms of life. What is still left of Eastern traditions and character is steadily losing ground and becoming marginalized. The liquidation of colonialism and the material independence that Eastern peoples are acquiring vis-a-vis -vis Europe are closely accompanied by an ever more blatant subjection to the ideas, the mores, and the advanced and progressive mentality of the West. Based on the doctrine of cycles, it may be that anything of value from the point of view of a man of tradition, either in the East or elsewhere, concerns a residual legacy that survives up to a point not because it belongs to areas that are truly untouched by the principle of decline, but merely because this process is still in an early phase there. For such civilizations, it is only a matter of time before they find themselves at the same point as ourselves. Knowing the same problems and the same phenomena of dissolution under the sign of progress and modernity. The tempo may even be much faster in the East. We have the example of China, which in two decades has traveled the whole way from an imperial traditional civilization to a materialistic and atheist communist regime, a journey that the Europeans took centuries to accomplish. Outside the circles of scholars and specialists in metaphysical disciplines, the myth of the East is therefore a fallacy. The desert and roaches. There is no other civilization that can serve as support. We have to face our problems alone. The only prospect offered us as a counterpart of the cyclical laws, and that only hypothetical, is that the process of decline of the Dark Age has first reached its terminal phases with us in the West. Therefore, it is not impossible that we would also be the first to pass the zero point. In a period in which the other civilizations entering later into the same current, would find themselves more or less in our current state, having abandoned or superseded what they still offer today in the way of superior values and traditional forms of existence that attract us. The consequence would be a reversal of roles. The West, having reached the point beyond the negative limit, would be qualified to assume a new function of guidance or command, very different from the material techno-industrial leadership that is wielded in the past, which, once it collapsed, resulted only in a general leveling. This rapid overview of general prospects and problems may have been useful to some readers, but I shall not dwell further on these matters. As I have said, what interests us here is the field of personal life. And from that point of view, in defining the attitude to be taken towards certain experiences and processes of today, having consequences different from what they appear to have for practically all of our contemporaries, we need to establish autonomous positions independent of anything the future may or may not bring. Not bring. Not bring.